Welcome, Draculophiles. Welcome to Sundays with Dracula. Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. This is chapter 23 of Sundays with Dracula. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach in Philadelphia, the home of Bram Stoker's Notes for Dracula. Over 100 pages of outlines, early plot ideas, and research notes compiled by the author over the seven years he developed and wrote the book. It is an extraordinary record of the conception and development of a novel. We will certainly see something from Stoker's notes today. But first, joining me as co-host is author, publisher, creator of Dracula, The Evidence, Josh O'Neill. Hi, Josh. Hi, welcome, welcome back. Thanks. I've missed you guys. It's good to be back. It's nice to be missed. It's been it feels, too long. feels like coming home. <laughs> <laughs> We've had to switch up some dates with co-hosts, but I'm happy we got you tonight. But that also means we're going to get you twice in three weeks. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be around for the, you know, we're in the final leg of this thing. So, good. so this isn't um, your last appearance as Josh Hitchens last week was his last appearance. Right. And, no, um, I'm, I'm happy to be coming back. So we'll still have a last one from you coming up. So and I want to hear all about new developments with Dracula, the evidence. Um, but first, because while you were away, we got a spirits sponsor. I love um, it. And uh, I want to say a few words about that. And also, so I could just get drinking too. You know, it's like, I feel like I'm holding off. I mean, I've yeah. already had a couple sips. It's already. Yeah, maybe you could it. spike my coffee here. While I would definitely it. do that if I could. So um, this is, and this is long overdue for a vampire themed drink. Uh, and it's long overdue because I'm actually not a Bloody Mary lover. It's not something I really go to all the time. Um, but I have found a way that I love Bloody Marys, thanks to Tamworth and Art in the Age. And I'm calling this drink Dracula's Breakfast. And it is not made with vodka, which is the go-to for Bloody Marys usually. Um, uh, I use this uh, ski clubbin. Uh, Aquavit from Tamworth Distilling in New Hampshire. It's a ski club and is a great replacement for vodka. I mean, for me, everything's a good replacement for plain old vodka, but this one works especially well. Um, Aquavit, I really like a lot. Uh, if you don't know, Aquavit is a Scandinavian distilled spirit flavored with herbs. That's like the most basic way to, 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 to say it. Aquavit itself, the word means water of life. Um, just as the Gaelic word for whiskey, ushkaba, means water of life. Um, so that's where we get ushkaba, is where we get whiskey, ushkaba, whiskey, it's where we get the word from. So I feel like in a philosophic sense, kind of aquavit is like the Nordic version of scotch. You know, they're like, our water of life, here it is, aquavit. And in, you know, in Gaelic countries or Scotland, it's, it's scotch. Uh, traditionally, aquavit's main spice is caraway but this tamworth version includes a kind of ginger twist not a kind of it is it's a ginger twist uh, along with cardamom star anise and pink peppercorn and the base of it is a whiskey base it's a blend of bourbon barley and wheat whiskey maybe that's why i love it so much but and, and for the bloody mary mix i used this delicious Bloody the Vampire Slayer. Like, how could I not choose this for the show? Bloody the Vampire Slayer. Um, it is, uh, it's tomatoes, water, garlic, onion, horseradish, lemon juice, lime juice, vinegar, vegan, savory sauce, uh, which includes some spices, chili peppers, and salt. And it is made by Sundry Mornings Spice. And Sundry Mornings Spice is in Philadelphia. Uh, and you can actually get these at uh, Art in the Age, these products, you can order them online. One of the, one of the ways I made this Bloody Mary, um, this Dracula's breakfast kind of more attuned to my taste is I also added simple syrup to it. I sugared it up a little bit. I just like a little half ounce of uh, simple syrup in, in the mix. Uh, and that kind of helps balance out that salty, spicy, Thing for me that I usually don't like in a cold beverage, that salty, spicy thing. Um, but the simple syrup evens it out. It's really good. You can buy Ski Club and Aquavit online or at Art in the Age in Philadelphia. If you want to do both, 
they have them as a set uh, for a discount. And that's at the Art and the Age site. Steve will share that info in the chat, but I will do that right here online. And if you go to their, uh, if you go to the Art and the Age website into spirits and shopping, and here it is. They have this special now Sundays with Dracula, Ski Klubin and Bloody Mary, you know, it, as a package um, uh, um, uh, that, that you can order. And also remember from last week, you can still order Grave Robber for them. And you can also get the Grave Robber as a Halloween gram that comes in the coffin. And you missed the whole coffin opening last week, Josh. It was really exciting. It comes in a coffin with the little art in the age glass. Um, and that is still available as well. So let me head back to my a script here. Um, the And since... I think that Bloody Marys are more, it's more like a meal. I mean, it's, it's a heavy thing and you, you, it kind of really fills you up. It's not a drink that I kind of want to spend two hours on usually. Um, it's something I just like to drink right now as I've been doing all week with this stuff. Um, I have to prep myself. I have to, it's, like, it's like homework. Not only do I have to you know, read the text, but I also have to drink all week to make sure I really uh, am a good drinker on the weekend. You poor, right? poor man. <laughs> um, but... So halfway through the show, I'm actually going to make another cocktail with Aquavit. So um, uh, that'll be delicious. And you'll see what that is later. So awesome. So thank you to uh, Tamworth. Uh, thank you to Art and the Age for providing this cocktail for me today. And uh, I encourage everybody to support them. And there will be more delicious cocktails from Tamworth uh, through the rest of the run of this show. Josh, what is new? You hinted to me that there are some new developments maybe with Dracula. I, I did. So there are a number of new developments. Um, we have a new Dracula related project, a new edition. Of let me let, let, remind everybody, especially we have some new listeners because we had some new programs. We have the Stoker on Stoker, Mark Gatiss and also people coming to the show new might not know what Dracula the Evidence is. Yes, of course. So so the concept of Dracula the Evidence is that we took the text of Dracula, which is, of course, all in the form of diaries, telegrams, newspaper clippings, journal entries, um, even Dr. Seward's phonograph recording, and we're producing all of these authentic documents. So we're doing a box set of Dracula that comes in a briefcase, and you open it up, and inside you have Jonathan's journal and Mina's diary. And the record. I'm of, sharing the pre-order page too. Oh, beautiful! I love it. I love it. You're doing the uh, the sales job for us. There we go. But yeah, so you can see in there, it's a whole assortment of stuff where you you can read through the text of Dracula as a sort of scholar going through these uh, archival documents, like trying to find you know got maps of London that track the progress of, of the characters and mark the different locations. Got the key to Carfax Abbey. Um, so it's this sort of interactive, experimental way to experience the book, which, uh, you know, one of my favorite things about Dracula has always been the sort of diegetic document nature of it as a sort of weird epistolary novel that has all these different sources. And so to be able to pick through it as this box of primary sources is, is really cool and fun and exciting. Um, that was the Immortal yeah, like, edition that I just shared. The Immortal edition has a special box to it as yeah, well. And this, is the, the, uh, this is the archive edition, um, yes. which is a little... So this is the one that comes in a briefcase. The Immortal edition comes in a sort of casket. Um, and then, so what we're announcing this week is that uh, on Wednesday, we'll be launching a new Kickstarter to do a book format version of this. Um, you know, we've obviously had a lot of requests since our cheapest version of this is $400 currently. Um, people want a more accessible version. So we're doing a really deluxe- but well worth it, so. Yes, very, very well worth it. I mean, when you see the level of detail and obsessiveness and production that we're putting into this thing, it's clear where those $400 went. Um, but we want people, you know, who can't spend $400 on a, on a book to be able to, uh, to uh, participate in this thing. So we're doing an art book version um, that we're gonna try to kickstart launching this Wednesday. 
and it'll be this beautiful deluxe book where we'll take all of the art uh, that we used for the box set and we use them as illustrations for a deluxe oversized edition of Dracula, where we'll have like a signature from Mina's journal and a signature from Jonathan's diary bound into the book as smaller um, items. And we'll have, uh, you know, use the photographs and the telegrams and the handwriting all as sort of illustrations in a postmodern way of, of illustrating the novel and approaching it in a new way with gatefold maps and all kinds of really cool production uh, stuff. Uh, so we're excited uh, to launch Sold. that. Oh, I want one. Yeah, I'm going to buy one. Uh, Don't worry. <laughs> and it's another opportunity to get the different sets that we have, too. We we're going to have tiers where we have discounts where you can get both things at the same time. Um, but the thing I really want to show off to you guys is we've started getting the proofs of a lot of our different items that go into the box. And, and I've been... Uh, we've been playing it very close to the vest in terms of what we've been willing to show people because we don't want to spoil too much. Um, but I do want to share uh, this with you guys. So we've got, I'm holding in my hands, Jonathan's journal, mm -hmm. uh, which you can see is this beautifully produced. You can see the blind debossing on there. Um, so it's a little like sort of leatherette soft cover with this like sort of custom enclosure. Um, and you can see our printer is amazing. You can see like the, the marble cool edges. marble edges, nice. Um, and you can see, it's maybe hard to see on a Zoom call, but you can see like the hand aging they've done on here. They've like mm -hmm. sanded the edges of this. So it feels like a genuinely old object. It's, it's just unbelievable. Um, so. Up the end papers here. Got Jonathan Harker, sort of reminiscent of red blood cells. Yeah. Um, and then we have we have the shorthand, which we have we have had the entirety of Jonathan's journal uh, transcribed by one of the few people who still write Pittman short shorthand in the world today. Um, mm. She's an expert, and we have it, you know, dutifully transcribed on the facing page, so it's still readable. Oh, that's um, great. But it's after all this work, it is so exciting to be able to actually hold this thing in my hand. Go, right, like, this is Jonathan's journal. We have made this thing. It still has a ways to go. There's still a number of, of production changes we're going to make. And this mm -hmm. is just a dummy. Um, but we are just so damn excited about this thing. Um, and I'll have more stuff to show you guys next week because we'll have we have Mina's diary, too. And we have the record and we have all this different stuff. Um, Jennifer wants to know what the price of the art book is going to be. Are you allowed to say the price right now? Or yes, you it'll be a hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. Okay. Uh, hundred dollars. Which is still art. not still not cheap, but compared to four hundred, incredibly it is. cheap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a quarter of the price. So. Yes. 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 Uh, but yeah, oh. we're 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 excited, and we've been, uh, and uh, yeah, Kyle Cassidy, uh, my friend who is also a friend of Kyle yours, Ross, and yeah. two who I think sort of connected us. Uh, He's been hard at work uh, this week taking sort of in character photos of all the dummies as this sort of like 1930s archivist who originally came upon this material before it was lost. Um, and uh, so he's been sort of staging this whole photo shoot like uh, in sort of in the world of, mm -hmm. of these documents and the photos are so unbelievably beautiful and cool. And we've just been hustling like crazy to get this project up and running. It's going to launch on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Great. Um, and we're just having having a ball working Make on it. Make sure you post a link on the Sunday's Facebook page. Of course, uh, I will post like crazy. Or, 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 or just send it to me and, I, and I'll post it on our group page too. And Britta, from, who, who listens from Germany, said, would it be possible to send an email to all the Dracula Club members when this is going to be available? And I will extend that, absolutely. So, yes, absolutely. Um, that would be I can great. send it out to the list. So Amazing. Well, I'm so excited to share it with you guys. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's yeah. I I can't wait to see this whole thing when it's done. It'll be it's it's really exciting. So, all righty. Well, I I can't wait. We're chapter twenty three today. I cannot wait to talk to you about that because that's what we do here on Sundays with Dracula. We don't just talk about these gorgeous Dracula editions and cocktails. Because what we do here on Sundays with Dracula is illuminate, unravel, disentangle. Bram Stoker's novel about bloodsuckers in the 1890s, one chapter at a time. 
Bram Stoker's Notes for Dracula are just one of the very many gems in the Rosenbach's collections. You can go online. You can see some of our collection guides as well as our gallery gateways of past exhibitions, other virtual programs and courses we are creating. I'll tell you about a couple of these at the mid-break today. And I also want to thank everyone who attended the Stoker on Stoker presentation uh, on Wednesday night when Dacre Stoker did his uh, great present multimedia presentation about how his Uncle Bram, as he calls him, Uncle Bram, uh, came to write the, uh, uh, the novel. And thanks to anybody who attended the Monsterama panel on, um, on Friday evening here, East Coast time. Uh, and that's actually been saved. Uh, it, was, it was called Masters of Dracula. It was with John Edgar Browning, David Scala, myself talking about, you know, Bram Stoker writing Dracula. Um, uh, you can find that online. I'll, I'll uh, send uh, uh, the, the links, the links on the Facebook page, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure the link goes out in the chat today during the mid break. We have two special guests coming up, uh, maybe three, but I definitely can say two. Uh, one of them you know is Sir Christopher Frayling will be here on November 8th for chapter 27. Uh, that's very exciting for me and for a lot of Dracula files out there. He's kind of, you know, the king of Dracula studies and vampire studies. He's the first one that, you know, started really taking it seriously and was, and was publishing and writing about it in the 1970s. Um, and so Sir Christopher Frayling will be here for the last chapter and on for chapter 25 on October 25th, we're going to have Mark DeWidziak here. Uh, Mark DeWidziak is uh, a, 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 mainly as a Twain scholar and a, Tw a Mark Twain impersonator, and he does this great Mark Twain show, but he's also published books on uh, Kolchak the Night Stalker, Twilight Zone, Columbo, um, uh, he's done Dark Shadows stuff. So he's got, oh, and a Dracula book. He has a Dracula book. Um, it's like the bedside and bathroom companion to Dracula, something like that's really funny, really cool Dracula companion book. Um, uh, Mark DeWiziak is gonna be here on October 25th. So I'm trying to line up one more too. So we'll have the final three programs with special guests, but I haven't hit them all. And somebody mentioned to me, somebody, um, who is going to be on um, uh, the, what do you call it? Uh, so, uh, Monday Drag Chat uh, tomorrow night will be Dracufile Matt Hebert. Uh, he's, I'm sure he's in the chat today, uh, chatting away there. Matt's very funny and I'm looking forward to having him. But I was telling Matt about the audience size we attracted to this and he's like, what? I thought it was like 10 of us who were all on there, you know, like maybe like the 10 most active chat people. And I guess, I, I think not everyone knows how many people watch this show live. Around a hundred or so watch it live. On, um, on Zoom, it, the, the number ranges from like 60 some to about a hundred. And it just kind of fluctuates every week. But then on Facebook, there's, you know, maybe 20 to 30 people watching it live as well. Maybe more. It's so hard to tell with Facebook to get the, you know, understand how many people were really viewing it for a long period of time. There's all kinds of things you have to do for that. So about 100 people watch us live. And then I know the re-airs over the course of a few weeks, they'll get, uh, they'll get up to like six, seven, 800 views. So, um, uh, so a lot of people are watching the show and even over a hundred get to watch it live every week. So uh, it don't, it, I, I think I didn't realize that many people didn't know how many watch it and the drag chat. And actually it started because the Monday drag chat, I said, yeah, you know, it'll be, 30 people probably for Monday Drag Chat. Um, we hit, we've hit 40 on it, but it's usually, it's usually closer to 30. And he was just shocked with 30 people. Yeah. And it's, it's a nice little program. It's for members only. It's for the real hardcore, you know, track you files, the Dracula club people. Um, so that's our audience size. If, if people were interested in that. So, all right, I'm ready to talk about chapter 23. You ready? Me too. It's a good chapter. Good. All righty. Uh, it is. Um, we left action, chapter action 22. movie chapter a little bit. What's that? It has like an action movie scene, which Dracula yeah. does not have a lot of. Yes. So we had Dracula in, you know, uh, uh, what, two chapters ago now um, with the two attacks in the same mm -hmm. chapter. And now we get, you know, to see him again. It's always exciting. In chapter 22, last week, we left with Jonathan Van Helsing and Seward are still at Dracula's Piccadilly lair. 
and Arthur and Quincy have gone to investigate the houses at Mile End and Bermondsey for the rest of the boxes. So, um, and, and thanks to Tucker, um, who's probably in the chat today. He's probably in the chat as Shannon Christine. That's his wife. He uses his wife's account to watch the show live when he's not a co-host. Um, but Tucker's probably there. And Tucker, remind, I was confused about when they went into to this Lair and Piccadilly last week, they were like, eight. Oh, there's there should be nine bo eight of nine boxes are here. Where's the other one? And I was I was getting confused. Like, wait a minute. They they knew that there were 29 in Carfax. They didn't understand the math. And he reminded me that in chapter 20, Jonathan learned that they um that there's 29 in Carfax, um, six boxes. Well, of the 50 that were in car or in Carfax, six were taken to 197 Chick Sand Street in Mile End Newtown. Six were taken to Jamaica Lane in Bermondsey, and um, and that left twenty one left over because there were then there they, then there was twenty nine in Carfax, so there's twenty one left over. Six and six, there should have been nine boxes at three forty seven Piccadilly, and there were only eight. So now they know that there's they know the whereabouts of forty nine boxes out of fifty, and they still have to find the last. And they won't. Sorry, big spoiler. Um, the uh, <laughs> that'll be the, the final pursuit. What do you but, think the logic is of how Dracula chose how to divide his boxes? That's something I want to talk about later because it's on because because Van Helsing mentions it specifically yeah. as part of his reasoning about Dracula's logic. Right. Um, so hold that one, and then we will definitely hit it. Um, because it is there, there is some. There's a lot to be said about it. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, the last chapter, remember, was Jonathan's diary. The whole chapter was Jonathan Harker's diary. Um, and now, for the beginning of this chapter, we're back to Seward's diary. Um, and I think partly so we can observe Harker. Uh, and everybody's focal point needs, seems to be on Harker now. It should all be on Mina, but they're all focusing on Jonathan. How is Jonathan going to handle the, you know, uh, the the attack on his wife um, that was made? And and the chapter starts three October. The time seemed terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Godalming and Quincy Morris. And then here he is looking at Harker. The poor fellow is overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night, he was a frank, happy-looking man with strong, youthful face, full of energy and dark brown hair. Today, after the attack from Dracula now, because um, we've had three chapters now, and this is all the same day. This is still, you know, last night when that attack happened. Today, he is drawn, haggard. Um, today, he is a drawn, haggard old man whose white hair matches well with the hollow, burning eyes and grief-written lines of his face. His energy is still intact. In fact, he's like a living flame. This may yet be his salvation for if all go well, it will tide him over the despairing period. He will then in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow, I thought my own trouble was bad enough, but his, first of all, that ending, I thought my own trouble. What, what's your trouble, Jack? So um, I, don't get it. <laughs> I guess he's referring to how he's lost Lucy, um, who was not gonna marry him anyway. Yeah, um, so has everybody else. Yeah, so has everybody. So it's not really your own trouble. Um, but uh, Seward is such a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're, but I, I was interested in this last week, especially because how are the how are the men going to treat Jonathan? And and part of the way they do treat him is that they are observing him, um, that they're really taking a look at how's he, almost like how's he going to hold up under this strain that he is under. Because for these Victorian men, this is like the war. It's it's worse than Dracula assaulting them, is Dracula assaulting your own woman while you're even in bed. I mean, Dracula does the worst thing that he could possibly do for these kind of Victorian men. Um, and they're all paying attention to that. And, and then we have this classic like Gothic horror trope of the hair turning white overnight. Yeah. Uh, just such an omnipresent trope and I'm fascinated by it because I, I, I don't know where it comes from. Do you have any idea where the 
I know there are a lot of historical stories about historical figures whose hair supposedly turned white. Overnight. Yeah, I wonder how far back it goes. And I wonder if there's old kind of historical kind of, you know, records that talk about it. Um, you know, I think there's someone in the Bible whose hair turns white overnight. Hmm. Um, I can't, be. I can't remember who, I think in the old Testament, there's a, um, there's someone who studies the, ta the Torah so hard that his hair turns white, I think. Um, but he's young. He's like supposed to be 20. I can't remember. If somebody knows that drop it in the Q and a, so I can uh, pull that out. Um, uh, yeah, but... I, I, if I think it's like a young man who is for some reason, he's, he's too young to do something. And so he studies so hard that his hair turns white overnight. I think I, I might be getting the details wrong, but it's something like that. Um, and then they say Marie Antoinette, I think the night before she was executed, her hair turned white. Um, but I'm just fascinated by this trope because it's not, as far as I know, a thing that really happens to people. It is, and especially overnight. And it's the suddenness. It's the shock or fear. Something, you know, extreme has happened to make it go immediately that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or uh, Jonathan has been so stressed out that he's stopped dyeing his hair um, <laughs> <laughs> and it all washed out. Um, yeah, it's but but it's the all at once. And it is it is a uh, uh, as far as I know, it's it's something that can't happen. Um, there's no way your hair is going to turn, you know, change overnight um, as as this appears uh, to be with him or they're all noticing it right now. I think they notice it earlier. Right. Um, or was it right after the attack that it's first mentioned? It is. It's right after the attack. Yeah, I think that's right. So it's odd in the Coppola version. The, um, the um, uh, some. Oh yeah, somebody mentioned it. <laughs> Matt mentioned it. The Keanu Reeves right. job and that. Yes. Like suddenly, one scene he has white hair. Yeah. And like, and it just he just has it. Like it doesn't seem to be like nobody mentions it or discusses it. He just has white hair, and it's like, what's going on? So yeah, it, I feel like it reads much better than it looks. You know, <laughs> like it's when you see on screen someone's hair immediately turn white. It seems much more silly than when you read it in a book. Holly says Moses. Um, I don't know. Somebody needs to. Or does Moses' more... hair turn turn white overnight? Somebody needs to give me some more research on that. Maybe if they see if that's true. Uh, and Steve, our, our chat Renfield uh, every week says, um, uh, Canatis, Canatia sabita is a medical term for hair turning white overnight. Uh, it is almost universally acknowledged as myth, um, but not entirely. He says a 2013 study in the International Journal of Trichology found 84 reports of unusually rapid adult hair blanching, blanching in medical literature between 1800 and the present day. So I, I don't know. I mean, it still doesn't, you know. Well, we also have Dracula whose hair changes color overnight. Holly says it's after the burning bush uh, or, or the bush that doesn't, the bush that burns, but doesn't burn. Um, uh, Moses's hair turns white. Oh, fascinating. There you go. So thank you, Holly. Um, yeah, so his hair is turned white. So and and he's he's a mess. Drawn well, he's a mess, but he's also got that fire in him. He says the energy. He's like a living, living flame. flame, which is bad, clearly, because that means you're consuming yourself. That means you are so enraged. I mean, for Jonathan, it's he's so he he wants his you know vengeance so badly on Dracula that that he's burning up. Um, and Van Helsing also notices this and decides that I'll give you guys a Drac, I'll give you a Dracula lecture so you can calm yourself down. And uh, I have studied over and over again since they came into my hands all the papers relating to this monster. I like that though. He's also like he's a scholar, you know. And I've got let's go back to the beginning, or he's like an investigator on the case, you know. And like, you know, and, and this is a trope that happens, and 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 uh, in. In detective stories or cop stories, especially where the investigator, let's go back to the beginning. Let's look at all the evidence fresh again and see if we can come up with anything. Um, and uh, and Stoker get, or, or or and Van Helsing here gives another lecture, and he's talking about Dracula, how he um, about his power, but he not only has great power, but he also has knowledge of it, which I think is interesting. He's like he's not only is he super powerful, but he understands his where his power comes from or how to use his power in a sense. And then he brings up Arminius again of Budapest, who he's brought up before. Um, 
uh, to give this uh, and another, and I didn't say a lot about this in the last time. I just quickly mentioned that it was our, you know, he's, he's probably, as all the notes and all the annotated say that it's likely Stoker kind of giving a name drop to Arminius Vanbury or Armin Vanbury of uh, um, uh, who, who, who someone that he knew. And I didn't say a lot about last time when it happened. It was the, it was the lecture he gave in chapter 18. But Arminius Vanbury was a Hungarian professor of Oriental languages at Budapest University in Hungary. He's also a traveler, an author, um, uh, and, and a spy. He actually, by, by, by visiting or by meeting people in, say, the Ottoman Empire and government officials, he was actually feeding information back to the British government. And then at one point, he's, I'm pretty sure, living for a while in England. And Stoker met Vanbury at least twice. Uh, and 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 the the evidence for that is in the biography of Henry Irving that Stoker writes, and he mentions Vanbury. He has at a dinner that they have there once, and he mentions another time when he meets him when Vanbury gets some kind of award. So, so the question is really why is he name dropping Arminius of Budapest University, this brilliant person who knows all this stuff twice? This time he actually says he's dead. Um, uh, the, and um, or he hints that he has he has died, right? He says uh, he. Uh, oh no, no, no! Of course, he's that's talking Dracula, about Dracula. He's talking so about. So that's Dracula he's talking about. So, but he's learned this from Arminius, and um, um, either for me, either um, there's a whole kind of thing, especially uh, McNally and Florescu really go into this, and they kind of want to, and 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 they kind of think that this was. The, this was where one of the ways Stoker could have learned so much information about Vlad Tepish is that Van Barry most likely knew it. So, um, but then again, that also presupposes that they had a relationship where they talked a lot. We actually don't have the evidence of that. Um, either they were on very friendly terms um, and there's no correspondence that exists between the two. We don't have them, anybody writing about how their friends Stoker doesn't, Van Barry didn't, or Stoker just having met him a couple times and just know who he was and the things that he did in his life really admired him and dropped his name in the novel. Um, I think it's, I think it is true that Van Barry is the kind of person that seems like a great inspiration for Van Helsing for that character. I mean, that really works well that he's looking at somebody like this um, who travels and knows a lot and was a professor and, um, uh, that he'd be a great inspiration, that kind of figure for somebody like Van Helsing. So he's thinking of him when he's writing about Van Helsing a couple of times, especially given the lecture, it gives a nice little shout out to them. But I think I do think we're heading down the wrong track if it if we think that that means Vanbury is the one that gave Stoker information on vampires. I think when if Stoker meets Vanbury and they have conversations. I think Stoker's going to be one telling him all about vampires. Right. Um, he's been researching it for years now. Um, and we don't have any evidence that Vanbury knew anything about vampires or vampire folklore. That's not the kind of things that he wrote about in his travel accounts. Um, and he almost certainly knew who Vlad Tepish was just because he, if, if he knows the, the history of the, the Eastern Europe and the, and the countries, you know, that, uh, that he's in, um, but we don't know if Stoker ever, and he ever talked about that. So um, Stoker knew him, and and I and I love the connection with um, uh, I love the connection with Van Helsing and Van Barry. But that's about as far as you know I would go with that. So, all righty. Um, I don't know if you had anything on that. That's just a little nugget rabbit hole that no 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 it's very very interesting though because we because we didn't do it last time van is a fascinating character if you know you yeah. know him up and and read about him um uh he would he would travel into you know like uh, places that he was that white europeans weren't supposed to go to in disguise and um uh, uh which which uh, helped them later to gather information and to act as a spy and so uh pretty pretty interesting dude um Yes, uh, Vanessa in the chat has has mentioned maybe he he shared information about Vlad Tepish. Yeah, Vanessa though, and that's and that's what what about information on Vlad Tepish? That's what I've you know like we don't know if yeah. they actually shared anything. 
um, the um, uh, Holly mentions that Banbury doesn't die until 1913, but that's the connection that if, you know, if, if we assume Banbury knows all about Vlad Tepish, then, you know, and Stoker is friends with him and he's writing this book and he's using the Dracula name, sure it's going to come up, but there's like, there's three ifs in there um, right. that we don't have the, 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 the answer for. So, um, but I, I love that, you know, Van Bar and especially as his name gets dropped twice by Van Helsing, I think the connection is clearly in Stoker's mind that this right. is somebody who he thinks of as a kind of Van Helsing like person. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and we get more details about Dracula here. Didn't even light. Uh, sorry. Um, trying to light my pipe and talk at the same time. You can't do both. Um, but uh, Arminius tells him that Dracula in life was a most wonderful man, um, <laughs> soldier, statesman, and alchemist. Um, he had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. He dared even to attend the Scolamons. It's almost, this is almost just repetitive here, though. It's just, you said all this before Van yeah. Helsing. Now, part of it is is the Seward thinks that Van Helsing is just talking to keep Jonathan's mind off it, but it's a great reminder for the reader. It's a great like, let's remember this is the person that we're hunting, um, and that he's done these kinds of things. Um, and then we get into the brain stuff, and the, there's a three different directions I want to go with brain stuff here, um, and uh, brain powers survive the physical death. Um, he says, well, in him, the brain power survived the physical death, meaning Dracula has died. And now he has, you know, he's now he's the undead. Um, though it would seem that memory was not all complete. Um, and that's curious because Dracula seems to have a great memory talking about the races of his people and the history of his country with Jonathan. But memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind, he has been and is only a child, but he is growing. And some things that were child at first, at the first, are now of man's stature. He's experimenting and doing it well. And if it had not been that we have crossed his path, he would be yet, he may be yet if we fail, the father or furtherer of a new order of being. I almost said Fuhrer, and I'll get to that in a second <laughs> too. Enough of a new order of beings uh, whose road must lead through death, not life. It's very Nazi-like, this kind of thing. Well, I mean, it's, Van Helsing's not being Nazi, like the way Dracula is, you know, here. Um, but when we get school amounts again. Hey, I love that. Um, I want to go to the school amounts. Um, uh, brain, and brain like a child you have when you're undead, but then you have to kind of relearn. I mean, is, is Van Helsing saying that he still has his mighty brain. Well, he is. He's saying he still has his mighty brain and he would have conquered us already if he still had his full brain capacity. But he's, because he's undead, he's kind of less than human in the way he thinks now. And he has to kind of, re the child brain is really strange. Yeah, I, I have trouble following like what the logic is here about his sort of mental capacities because he says that he's learning and getting smarter, but he's clearly gotten much, according to this, gotten much dumber and more simplistic since his life as a human. Um, so uh, why is he developing if he hasn't developed in the hundreds of years before? Um, it, it almost sounds like in the hundreds of years before he was de-evolving. Um, that, that he's gotten more childlike over the years, but now all of a sudden he's becoming more. Um, and then the Dracula we see seems to be very strategic and thoughtful and always has a plan for everything. And so I don't follow the logic about the child brain and the arc of his changing uh, like adult mind. You mentioned that the yeah, devolution. I think there's a lot here. I think there's I think there's a good bit here related to these kind of anxiety, and it's this 19th century anxiety, especially over Darwinism, uh, evolution, uh, activism. You know, this kind of like fear yeah. of reverting to something ancient, and that that's like a big thing in in a lot of weird uh, fiction. Um, that that weird fantastic fiction that happens at the end of the of the 19th century degeneration. 
uh, criminal brains. And we'll hit this again in a couple chapters when he specifically mentions, you know, Nordau's uh, Nordau, whose degeneration book, and Lambroso, who writes about, you know, uh, criminal brains. Um, we'll hit those specifically in a couple chapters, but this is all tied in with it, I think. There's a great question from, and I think, well, there's a great question from Anastasia that she sent me. Um, and then she says, I was reading a fascinating article by Theodora Goss, a great author who I've tried to get on the show and, and have not been able to, um, uh, and about Victorian anthropology and how Victorian monsters frequently represented fears of atavism and degeneration or regressing back down the evolutionary ladder. Dracula, of course, very neatly represents this. He's described as, as animals. Um, and this one will hit them. Um, when, when he comes on the scene, he comes from a place that's clearly behind Britain, you know, with the superstitious villagers, trains not running on time. Uh, so what then, she asks, do we make of his knowledge, his mighty brain and learning beyond compare? She says, I've been thinking a lot about how Dracula doesn't fit completely into the monster as evolutionary throwback category and would love to talk about it, blah, blah. Um, the, um, I'm sorry, the blah, blah was, you know, you know, she was thanking me and I have lots of thoughts of my own, that kind of thing. I wasn't trying to <laughs> say your work was blah, blah, obviously. Um, I love Anastasia's questions. Um, I, I see a lot of that and I, and I, it's almost like, I think it exists in this novel because there is this anxiety in the culture and Stoker as an author is kind of putting, because he's writing a monster story. Those anxieties are coming out in the text, but I think it's extra fascinating because it seems that the character of Van Helsing himself is also having real issues with this kind of idea in that here's this awful beast from who represents the past and kind of, in, you know, coming up into the future, like some, something that we have supposed to be evolved away from, but now it's threatening us again. And Van Helsing's response is, oh, but it's even as mighty as it was, it's still got a child brain now and has to learn how, and I don't see any evidence of that. I see Dracula as having memory of having a great plan of, um, I mean, it might, you know, it, it, it might be too simplistic in a sense for us, but he has, and, and he'll get into this toward later in the chapter about, you mentioned with the boxes and that kind of thing, but I almost see this as, it's just this layered anxiety of, of, of degeneration of what we most fear is the, yeah, the this almost seems like something that Van Helsing invented him, himself as, as a way to sort of distance, distance themselves from, from Dracula. Um, he is, it didn't earlier, isn't he called like he has some, he has a uh, Renfield mentions it. he has like this great theory of the development of brain matter or something like that. Right. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just doesn't square with the Dracula that we've seen at all, who's doing legal maneuvers and has this a complex plan and multiple properties and always has layers of strategy in place. Um, so it's, it's more, I think we're seeing less about Dracula in this passage than we're seeing about Van Helsing, which is yeah. very interesting. And, and um, how, what, and how he sees this mon what this monster represents to him right exactly um, um, and maybe that's revealing about what this monster represents to stoker on some level oh definitely you know i think um the um and then but that final thing there that father or further of a new order of being that's like some creepy eugenics nazi program talk it really is there, you yeah know? and that's what he sees Dracula represents that he is creating this kind of new order of being. This took me down a rabbit hole last night, like Nazi vampires. And I'm thinking about, and I found this great little short film <laughs> that I put on a Facebook group page and how many people have now used Nazis and vampires. And because the, uh, the Nazis were all into the occult and investigating supernatural. And, um, uh, but, uh, and that's been fictionalized so much too. And, you know, even in uh, Indiana Jones, but in Hellboy, um, yeah, what we do in the shadows. One of the vampires used to be a Nazi, um, <laughs> and they tried to make more Nazi vampires. Um, the uh, oh, the strain, of course, that somebody mentions. That's all you know. The 
one head vampire trying to bring back the big vampire guy is was was Nazi. Um, uh, so there's all kinds of interesting things there, but that line especially hit that level for me. Um, uh, so, um, but Jonathan right away is like, whoa, whoa, how's he experimenting? <laughs> You know, it's like, like a good question. Yeah, I mean, Van Nels says he is experimenting and doing it well. And Jonathan, Jonathan's like, yeah, here's here's a question. Could you stop and just yeah, tell slow me what's down. going on? Um, and uh, and Van Helsing, first of all, he puts him off a little bit. He's like, um, he doesn't tell, he doesn't answer it at first. You know, he's got he has this big child brain of his is working. Um, for well, for us, he just he just keeps reinforcing this point. It is as yet a child brain. For had he dared at the first to attempt certain things, he would long ago have been uh, beyond our power. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. We, we, this is soon. We'll get into it with the boxes and things. Um, uh, and then he does the festina lente to Jonathan, like settle down, slow down, um, uh, because oh no no I'm sorry. He says festina lente may well be his motto, Dracula's. Motto. If you don't know the the people don't know the the, the festina lente, it's a it's a classical saying means to make haste slowly. So it's kind of a it's it, it's it's seeming oxymoron there, a paradox. Um, but what it really means is kind of like don't be in such a rush, you know. Like don't you can do things quickly, and you want to accomplish something as quickly as you can. But if you rush it, then you're going to miss details. You're going to mess it up. So yeah, move proceed quickly without rushing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Dracula seems to be doing that. Um, I don't think so at all. I just think he's, he's just taking his good old sweet time doing everything he does. So Dracula. Yeah, there's, there's an old baseball saying that uh, uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. I feel like that's the same idea. <laughs> good. I like that. Um, and uh, Harker... And then he goes into this and he says, um, oh, Harker calls him out first. Like, come on, like, <laughs> be more plain, you know. And and this is where he gets into the what exactly he's been doing and how Van Helsing interprets Dracula as experimenting and learning as he goes along. Um, and first it's about with Renfield, how he made use of Renfield, the zoophagist patient, to effect entry into the house though in all afterwards he can come whenever he wants, but he must first make entry only when asked thereto by an inmate. And then he, the other example, which seems to work better for this argument is about the boxes. Um, and you asked this at the top of the show, that um, how he moved the boxes. Like first he had people do them, he had companies do it for him. And then he hired individual carters to move them around. And then he started to help them in the second time. And then it seems well, we know now that he has one box that he hasn't asked anybody to move it. He's just done it himself. But isn't that because the quantities of boxes are getting smaller and smaller? So he needs less help moving them. I don't think Van Helsing answers this question very well. And I think it makes no sense. I mean, <laughs> like, he, yeah, he, for 50 boxes, he needed to hire people. And then for 20 boxes, he needed to hire less people. And then for one box, he could do it himself. I don't know if that's a yeah. sign that he's experimenting and learning as much as just a sign that he's moving smaller and smaller quantities of boxes. Yes, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and, but, but we can ask what about this plan? Um, and is this a good plan? And does this show Dracula being brilliant in the way he has set this up? Is this the kind of, is that, is that kind of what you were asking at the beginning? Or part of what well, yeah, sort of what is his strategy here is his long term plan that all of these boxes are going to go different places. Um, so he has a vast multitude of, of hiding places. It seems yeah. like that's the long term idea, right? He doesn't need eight boxes in this house in Piccadilly. Right. He only would need one in any place, really. Um, but I, I, the fact of sending six here and six there and keeping 21 here, like it implies he has like I'm that it doesn't seem haphazard it seems like well I'm going to send six here because I know I'm going to eventually dispatch those to these different ones in this neighborhood and I know I need six over here um, so I can bring them to these spots and I want to have uh, so it's interesting just how he's laying all the, this stuff the out. danger has already happened and it's 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 the I don't think it's the plan that's bad it's just that he didn't do it right away like he wasn't yeah fast. he's just not moving fast enough these guys are good in, in the way they jumped yeah, right on this. It, right. He left all 50 in Carfax. Guess what? 
Dracula wouldn't have any earth to sleep in. Right. Um, and if, you know, and, and even just leaving two in a place, as long as somebody goes to that place, then they're going to get all of them that are in the place. Yeah. And so by, he's just started this process and, and he's doing it directionally too. It's like in Carvac, it's like, there's three different areas of London that he's in. Right. He's in and he's probably also thinking if I dispatch these one by one to different places, um, and in the process of doing that, someone comes upon my main store of them and destroys them, then I'm screwed. So I want as many backup plans as possible. Which is why there's one not there right now, because right. that's probably in the start. First, I'll just move a bunch here, and then I'll just move them out individually to different places. Yeah. I've actually begun that already. One, like of these three locations now, not Carfax, he's taken one of them from those and put it somewhere else. And, yeah. and he just hasn't. Uh had the time to get to this yet so but it's interesting to me that in whitby he sleeps in the suicide seat right he doesn't need to rest in these boxes i mean the he just likes here about that it is just well i think i think it helped i think it, it must help him i think he restores must. his powers on some level I mean, the, the text never says that, but that's like kind of where I think, you know, you need to go because the sun doesn't kill him, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, but it, it must give him strength in some way that, yeah. that, that to, to rest in these. But you're right. He doesn't need them. Um, he can. He doesn't need I mean, he doesn't need to be out of the sun. Um, we don't even know how much rest he really needs. Um, uh, but it certainly is something that he wants to have and it helps him. And, and it must be more than once. He must need it in some way because of all the care that he's taken for this. And because as soon as they're finding this out, this is when he starts his flight away. Like, okay, I can't do it yet. Um, uh, so he must need it in some way. Yeah, they seem pretty important to him. Like as a lot of his like appearance in London revolves around these boxes. So they must be pretty vital on some level. Somebody's hit me with another question here, another couple um, things. Uh, more, you know, uh, more biblical here. The, uh, the uh, burning bush. Um, Someone mentioned that uh, white hair can be a sign of leprosy, marking one is unclean. This is from Leviticus 13, 9 to 11. Um, uh, and um, he, oh, and then Nicholas here puts that, he says, Moses's hair does not turn white in scripture after seeing the burning bush, though it does in Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments movie. Um, <laughs> um, in Exodus 34, 35, after Moses sees God on Mount Horeb, he has to veil his face from the people of Israel because it shines with the glory of God. Right. Maybe that's kind of where that's, you know, misunderstanding is coming from. But Right. But I, there is something in the Old Testament about someone whose hair turns white from studying the Torah, a young person who studies the Torah so hard that it makes their hair turn white. I can't remember all the details of it. It's in there somewhere. I'm, I'm sure of it. Anastasia also threw in here and we're about the child brain, maybe it refers to his moral sense rather than his intellectual. Oh, that's interesting. You know, capabilities, um, which uh, seems more in tune with, you know, with what, how Van Helsing feels about Dracula, that sure he's super mighty brain, but because he's evil and trying to take over the world and destroy people, that makes him a child. Just as it but, just happens later with the criminal brain. Like, oh, well, because you're interested in criminal activities, you're certainly not as advanced as, you know, the rest of society. But that doesn't sort of fit in with this idea that he's experimenting and developing and his brain is, is maturing because he's not becoming more empathetic or more, um, no. more morally sound. Okay, so the boxes, and now they have to get ready. Oh, it's still Seward, Van Helsing, and uh, Harker here. Um, and Van Helsing saying all this, and Van Helsing's being very hopeful in this whole chapter. You know, um, he's he's taken the mean cue and and not kind of doom and gloom, but. But there's some doom, but I'm going to be hopeful. And he even says, today is our day. We must go sure, if slow, and lose no chance. 
Uh, and then they hear the double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. I love that double, the double postman knock. There's a great note in the Klinger uh, annotated about the, uh, um, about how that's in uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, the uh, stories Doyle mentions that a few times that the postman will ring twice or the postman will knock twice. And then that is actually where, and, and Klinger mentions it, where, uh, um, uh, always rings twice. Twice. Um, uh, Kane. Kane, thank you, uh, gets that um, uh, from the, uh, the John M. John M. Kane, right? He gets that uh, from the uh, James, from that, right? James, James Kane. James Kane. James M. Kane. Um, names are out of my head today. Uh, that's where he gets that phrase from is that he's a British friend of his mentioned it, that the postman rings twice. Right. And he's like, ooh, that's a good title, way of signaling somebody. Um, and it's in Dickens, of course. This is how I know it. Because because even in Pickwick Papers, chapter 54 is containing some particular, it's the title of chapter 54 in Pickwick Papers is containing some particulars relative to the double knock and other matters, among which certain interesting disclosures relative to Mr. Snodgrass and a young lady are by no means irrelevant to this history. So I like long titles for chapters. So. <laughs> Um, but I, I want to be clear here. They are in Dracula's house right now. Yes. It's amazing that they got a telegram in a house they've broken into. How did they, <laughs> I love this weird detail. They did know the address ahead of time. Because yeah, they, no, it makes, there's no reason they couldn't get a telegram there. It's just a funny idea to like send, to send yeah. essentially send mail to someone in a place that they've just burgled. One of the annotated's mentioned, I don't know if it was Klinger or one of the others mentioned, oh, hey, how did Mina know where they were? Well, they had a letter from the- well, They had his address, yeah. They right. had the address, so apparently she had that information and could send it. Um, but uh, the telegram arrives and the information in the telegram is what makes me think, what? How does, so it says, look out for D, this telegram come, telegraph boy knocks twice. Um, the uh, look out for D, he is just now 1245, come from Carfax hurriedly and hastened towards the South. He seems to be going the round and may want to see you, Mina. Um, the um, uh, it's very impressive. The time right now well, is, I think, supposed to be like quarter past one or something. Yeah, and telegrams come that quickly. I mean, everybody's sending telegrams off. I mean, if you read Sherlock Holmes stories too, this constantly happens. So you send off telegrams real quick. You send them to the boy, send the telegram, they go and they send it. Telegrams were like unbelievably miraculous for yeah, the that's wild. 19th century. They couldn't believe that this was all happening so much. Um, and it is, and they were just as concerned over it as people were concerned or concerned over email and quick text messages. Right. How's this ruining everyone? So um, the, uh, but my question is, how the hell does Mina know this? Like, like, is she watching out the window and seeing Dracula go into Carfax and then come running out? And she can tell what direction, like, I understand that he leaves Carfax, but can she really tell what direction he's going in? Um, well, presumably if she sees him leave, she would see like what road he leaves by. I, I don't know, see why not. Is he just walking then? Is he in a carriage? Yeah, I don't um, know. That's pretty general if, if they're, I mean, and first of all, if he's coming from Carfax, he's got a head, I, I don't know, if he's going south, he needs to go first west to really reach them. Now, I don't know. Like, I know it's southwest of where Perfleet Essex is, where Carfax is. So it's, and, and the asylum. So um, she says, he seems to be going around and may want to see you, Mina. I, I think this is an instance of Stoker's putting too much in here. And there's really no way she could really know this exactly. Or um, also the... If she's she's not safe, if she can see Dracula, <laughs> yeah, she's clearly not safe. Right. Right. Doesn't seem good. Um, and uh, that's the first question that I would be like, "Whoa, you know, like you could see Dracula, <laughs> yeah. like quick, let's get there." Yeah, right. And to make sure you stay safe. And um, uh, there's also the reminder here of using modern technology to fight Dracula with the telegrams. Um, that's what they, you know, part of their process is, um, 
is is using whatever technology is available to hunt him down. Um, the uh, oh, Elizabeth says, doesn't this chapter establish mean a psychic link with him? Oh, you know, because later they don't go into this, and maybe that's it. Maybe it's just a psychic link, and I'm wrong uh, about wondering how she observes it. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Elizabeth G. I think that's that's really. Oh, and and Locky mentions it, and um, very interesting. That seems that that must be it. It just there's just no way that she can watch him and then see that. Um, it has to be psychic. Um, and but again, the fact that that confused me. I was confused because there was no explanation in the text, and it's another one of those great examples of. Yeah. Stoker not telling us everything, that he leaves it for us to figure out, for smarter readers like Elizabeth and Lockie to tell me, um, to figure out what's going on here. I'm just telling you what's happening and what people are saying, and you've got to figure out how that all works in this world. I, so uh, That's I such a part of the joy of, of this yeah. novel, is like how much it invites you to play, to play with it. So, um, so that's it. So now... Um, I'm gonna finish my uh, Bloody Mary here. Oh, and I, I look. There's a. This is actually a steak with my um, <laughs> with my tomatoes in it there, and I and I've and I've cut my uh, celery into a steak as well. I love it. <laughs> so if Bonicula comes, you're in good shape. Bonicula just got this new. <laughs> of it. Wow! Oh, that's a beautiful it's cover. Beautiful. It's plush. It's like this. Wow! What a nice addition. Plush plush cover uh it's really nice little uh like anniversary edition that they did 40th anniversary edition i really love it oh look his eyes like kind of glow as i'm moving it in the light here amazing wow i'm glad you had that at hand for that reference <laughs> <laughs> all righty but uh, it's 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 also interesting to me they're sort of hanging out at dracula's house like they've sort of done what they came here to do and now they're sort of having a conference and getting telegrams. <laughs> like, it's interesting how they've sort of just made made themselves comfortable in this place where you'd think they would be a little freaked out to be. And I forgot I wanted to share the brain info in one of these notes. Uh, so I'm going to do that now before we this chapter really gets rolling um, uh, with, with the exciting thing that will happen. And this is um, the. Why don't we? Why don't I take a mid break and and then I'll I'll share this page from the notes, um, because I don't want to forget to remind everyone about the Dracula Club. Um, if you're not already a member, we're resurrecting the Dracula Club author offer just for the month of October. So you have until Halloween to share, to join the Dracula Club. Uh, and with the Dracula Club, it's a way of getting a discount membership to the Rosenback. For $30, and that's 25 hours off the regular price, you get a full year's membership uh, to the Rosenback and, and all the benefits that, it, that, that members get. Um, free exclusive access to our Monday Drac Chat program. 10% off of any reading courses. I'll share one, a new one with you in a moment. And 50% off any Rosenback programs. And some of you have already taken advantage of this. We have the Stoker on Stoker on Wednesday night. If you were a Dracula Club member, a Rosenback member, it's the same thing. You got 50% off of that program. We also have two virtual behind the bookcase programs coming up in October. And if you like when I share some of the notes during the show and talk about them on October 14th, uh, which is this week. Um, boy, I better finish getting that stuff ready. Um, uh, October 14th and October 28th, the librarian from the Rosamack, Elizabeth Fuller, who's been on this show as a special guest working with the notes for decades now. She and I are gonna share some of the notes in a, in a presentation about how Stoker came to write it. It'll be really exciting. Uh, I can't wait to do it. It's, it's, it's kind of an outgrowth of what we do at the Rosenbach and these behind the bookcase presentations where we bring people into the library and literally put the notes in your hands and start talking about them. We can't do that yet, uh, but we can do it virtually and we'll share the images with you like I do here on the show and talk about them. 
Uh, so that's an, uh, that's a program coming up that you would have 50% off if you wanted to attend that. But most of all, by joining the Dracula Club, you will have the undying satisfaction of helping support the home of Stoker's Notes for Dracula. So if you're not already a member, please join. Help support this show. Help support the Rosenback. If you are already a member, share this information with somebody you know. Send an email to somebody. Say, hey, I'm in the Dracula Club. I'm a Rosenbach member. You can join it too at this special discount only for the month of October. So don't forget to tune in Monday night, tomorrow night for Monday Drac Chat at 6.30 p.m. Eastern uh, East Coast time in the U.S. as one of our Dracophile audience members joins me to continue talking about this week's chapter tomorrow's Dracophile joining me will be Matt Hebert who has been with us from the very beginning uh watching this show and uh is very funny and and a lot of great pop cultural understanding and one of the reasons I've asked Matt to be on the show is he's actually this is actually the first time he's reading Dracula and I thought it would be great to have that perspective on this Monday Drac chat show is that you know We've had plenty of people here who have done all kinds of research um, uh, uh, and have read this book, you know, so many times. But with with Matt, it's a first time. There's a few of out there doing this for the first time too. Um, and I thought it would be great to have that perspective. So Matt will be on the show tomorrow night. Remember to watch Monday Drac Chat. You need to register for the Zoom link. It's not the same link of Sundays with Dracula. It is for Rosenbach and Dracula Club members only. There's no live Facebook stream. Uh, and I do not post the show online afterwards. You can only watch it live on Zoom. And I want to plug the uh, one of the new courses we have coming up that starts next month in November that was just announced, programs, virtual courses. Let me click on this here. And is a couple of just well one just started this with Chaucer poetry and pandemic that's already started that started on Friday night uh stage to screen great films from great plays in which inquire theater critic Toby Zinman comes and uh teaches a class uh on zoom uh she's chosen great plays that also have great film adaptations to them um uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Long Day's Journey Into Night, Cat in a Hot Tin Roof, and for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is not enough. Uh, that should be a great course. But a new one that we just announced is David, a David Copperfield course, a Dickens class. It's called Fond Parents and Favorite Children, Names and Family, and Charles Dickens's David Copperfield. The exciting thing about this course is not just that it's Dickens and Copperfield, which I love, but Wesley Stace is teaching this. Wesley Stace is a great musician and also a great novelist. Um, you may know him as a musician. He used to perform for many years under the name John Wesley Harding. And then he started publishing novels under his own name, Wesley Stace. He's finally married the career. Now he just goes by Wesley Stace. Um, he's taught it. Uh, he's taught literature and and music at Swarthmore, at Princeton, uh, and I've been. We've had him at the Rosenbach a couple times to perform. He's a fabulous performer. And uh, I, I've always known that David Copperfield is his favorite novel. So uh, I ask him every year if he'll come and teach Copperfield. And he finally said yes, um, because we could do it virtually. And it's so much easier for him to, again, still travel and do his shows. Um, but he's going to teach it virtually, a David Copperfield class. It starts next month. It already has... 12 or 13 people registered for it. So it's going to fill. So if you're interested in that and you wait till it starts on November 17th, uh, you're probably not going to get in. So uh, it's going to fill up. And I highly recommend taking a course uh, at the Rosenbach. And I highly recommend taking this course with Wesley Stace to read some Dickens. And if you are a Rosenbach member or a new Dracula Club member, you get 10% off all of the courses and um, uh, it, like, so if you're a Dracula Club member or you have the member tuition here, that's the one you want to click. So, all right. That is, I was supposed to have a delivery up here to, to kick off my next drink and it hasn't <laughs> happened yet. And I now have to text my children to bring something to me. Um, the, uh, Cause the next drink, I have an ingredient that's warm and they needed to bring it up for me. <laughs> So, and I hear my wife hollering for the Eagles game down there too, which I have <laughs> every Sunday for this. Um, 
There we go. Oops, and I and I can't see it all. Nor can I. Nor are my fingers uh, small enough to actually text. Uh, I'd be much better if I could send a telegram. Uh, but there we go. Um, the uh, oh, look at that. Kyle Cassidy's even in the chat today. So I haven't seen Kyle in the chat before. So hi, Kyle. So Hollis says, how do you join the Dracula Club? You join it on our website. It's not closed. We just resurrected it for the month of October. Um, uh, so you can join the Dracula Club up till October 31st. Awesome. Let us get back to this chapter. Um, the double knock on the door, the telegram, Dracula's coming. Um, the... Uh, and Jonathan right away is all like, I'm going to kick his ass. Um, uh, he, can't, Jonathan can't wait. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. Um, and, um, and then, and then he says, I care for nothing now except to wipe out this brute from the face of creation. I would sell my soul to do it. Now, Jonathan is justly super angry at Dracula. He has preyed upon his wife. He really, you know, wants to be the one that you know delivers the death blow to him to catch him. Um, then Helsing has to remind him and, and very kind of, you know, is in a very pious way that God does not purchase souls in this wise. And the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. But God is merciful and just and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madame Mina. Think you how her pain would be doubled. Did she but hear your wild words? Um, so he's got to set it like, you know, he, he cautions him against that kind of very impious vengeance that Jonathan is bent on now. And Seward described him early in the chapter as like a, a living flame that he's ready to explode. But of course, you're also consuming yourself um, and uh, not a, a good position for Jonathan to be in. Because, especially by the time we get the next chapter, this becomes a holy crusade. So you can't, you know, think that those thoughts uh, right now. Um, so um, I, I don't know if I'm getting my uh, drink here. Um, the, uh, the, and, and other episodes you've missed, like I had an episode where they brought up like pumpkin cupcakes for me. I was like, wow, this is so That's great. Amazing. And then, it, you know, today it's when all, I need it. It's all falling apart today, just, just yeah. when you were counting on them. <laughs> so, um, He's Dracula is going to show and, and Van Helsing mentions if, you know, if Dracula doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we have to start off for it won't do to leave Mrs. Harker alone after sunset. Um, and uh, the in. Um, and then he goes through all this reasoning here um, in Madam's telegram. He went south from Carfax. That means he went across the river and he would only do so its lack of tide which would be something before one o'clock uh, that he went south has a meaning for us. He is yet only suspicious. And he went from Carfax first to the place where he would suspect interference least. He must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him. That he is not here already shows that he went to Mile End next. This took him some time uh, for he would have, have to be carried over the river. And so I love this. This is like, this is so Sherlock Holmes here, like this kind of deductive yeah. reasoning. Like it's I've got cool. one little clue. He left south, oh, and Van Helsing is able to map out this entire journey. I love that kind of thing going on. And I've made a lot of Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, he also mentions the tide, the tides there, and and what time and how that would happen with the river. And I know in Leslie Klinger's annotated, he even puts a little chart for the tides, right? And I was wondering if and 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 I wonder if you looked at that in order to figure out a date. Um, yes, I mean. The, you know, we've talked about this before, but the, the more you dig into the dates, the more it rules out every possible date. Um, that's my understanding of Dracula is that can, it cannot have taken place on any individual year because there's something directly in the text that, uh, that contradicts every year. But yeah, we looked at Klinger's version and, and looked at that uh, at the tide chart, which I think means it would only match up I don't think it would match up to any date in the 1890s, I think was, if I remember right, that's what Klinger's version said. I yeah. think it matched up to like a, a couple of dates in the 1880s. Um, but then there's a number of things uh, in the text that 
that would prove it has to be at the very earliest 1891. Um, so it can't possibly have happened in the 1880s. So just one of the many ways uh, there's no possible way to determine the date yeah. and you just have to pick the least problematic date. All righty. Um, now I'm going to share this um, uh, note here, and I love sh I love this. This is about the child brain. Um, we're going like back and forth here today um, about this issue, which I guess maybe it means it's more important than you know I originally thought. Um, this is a great note. Here's, this is upside down. That's why this whole thing. The rest of this is this way, and these are all separate little memos that he has given himself over time. You can see the way the handwriting has changed. Um, and I want to look at this one right here to start with. Um, and it is a uh, memo and it's dated here. It says uh, five, four, so April 5th, 96, but under it is April 5th, looks like 91, but that can't be. Um, uh, it just be, or it could be from the rest. I, I I think it can't be just. Well, maybe it is. Well, anyway, let's let's let me let me read the note to you. Um, it is professor. In speaking of brains of of something. Oh, Drax. In speaking of Drax, I love how he, he even he abbreviates it to Drac. Yeah. Um, uh, of Drax brain growth speaks of the. Uh, heart brain and the sense brain um, uh, as oh, it's just forever. I'm not sure what this is. I think this is untranslated here. Uh, forever he is a baby in forever. Maybe it's in forever. He is a baby and has to learn all from the outside. And also, I don't know if you can see this, that it has been written over. It seems as if he maybe wrote this in pencil at one point and it had faded and then he wrote it over. Some of the words are exactly the same and they line up uh, and mm -hmm. some don't. So um, I don't have this physical document in front of me to really look at this, but I think that's what it is. I think it's written over again because maybe it had faded, but um, uh, I, I don't have it, so I can't uh, technically say that that is true, but this really freaks me out here. 5491, that doesn't make any sense for this note because he certainly hasn't named Dracula by this point in his notes in 1891. That comes later when he discovers his name and he clearly says Drax here, but maybe he didn't write Drac originally. But yeah, maybe that maybe there was the last time it was written, it said something else. So I don't, I, 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 this isn't something that I've done any investigation. I only discovered it this time looking at the notes. Um, uh, I think Elizabeth uh, is uh, Fuller is in our uh, chat today. So if she has anything to throw my way in the Q&A about this one, uh, that would be great. Um, but it's something I can investigate further and report on. But he oh, talks that's, in about, that's intriguing. That's a fascinating little mystery. But he does talk about the brain growth here. Here it is, finally. Hey, thank you. That's okay. Say hi, Lulu. Hi. This is... Hi. Cider, which is a little full, so I have to get some of this out of here. All right, see you, Lulu. Thank you so much. Lulu, wait, one, one more thing. Give me a glass from in there, any glass. Sorry, again. This is my second drink, and this is... Uh, oh, <laughs> she gives me this, like, great brandy snifter here. Uh, I just needed to pour some of that in there, so it's too much here. This, I needed it delivered because it's actually warm cider. And um, uh, uh, another way to drink this Aquavit, which I love, is this is about a half a mug of warm cider. And I wouldn't go half and half unless you really wanted to get loaded. Um, but, you know, maybe, you know, two to three. You could be, you know, one to two parts, um, whatever uh, works for you. Um, and uh, the I, I, I should put the I should, let me stop the share for a moment. 
Um, so it's cider and the aqua V. And I just think that would be it, it, it's such a well, I don't think because I've already tried it. Um, a delicious way to uh, spike your cider is with aqua V, especially because it's all those delicious spices that are going on in the aqua V that kind of add to the cider. Usually I have my warm cider with cinnamon, but I don't want any cinnamon in this because I think that will overpower the spices going on in the aqua V. But to really, you know, uh, uh, I've uh, really changed this. I've got a little shot of a uh, hearing cherry liqueur, which I love. I, you know, I've used it a few times on the drinks here. So a little bit of hearing cherry in there. Stir that. Mm, very warm. And I'm calling this the October hunt. Um, as in, uh, like, this is, the, this is the perfect, this is the kind of drink you want to warm yourself and relax with the fire after a day of hunting vampires. Some warm cider and aqua beat, a little hearing cherry in there. The October hunt made with ski clubbing. Mm -mm. That sounds delicious. That that is. Sounds oh like my really God. I just want to drink. stop the show and drink that. All right. Well, yeah. that. Um, so that is my second drink today. Let's go back to this. Um, uh, these notes. Uh, and so this memo here and the, and I love, cause this speaks to what we were saying earlier, or, 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 or especially the way Anastasia was talking about the kind of emotional moral or the, maybe the moral growth as opposed to the intellectual growth, because here he says, brain growth speaks of the heart brain and the sense brain that Van Helsing is clearly thinking about the brain in different ways, or at least according to Stoker, he wants him to think about the brain in different ways. And he has to learn, like a baby, has to learn all from the outside. Like you have to relearn not just how the world works, but you have to relearn, you know, the moralities of civilization or not learn them as you're a, you know, a terrible evil beast as Dracula is. And that note on, is on there. And I love this. This is just like a whole collection of different notes that I'll spin it around here. Um, and some of them are for late in the novel and some of them are dated. This is, you know, uh, December 28th, 95. This is just 24, 11, uh, November 24th, 95. He's dated them all here. You know, like this is this is added later. That's like a little pencil notation that's added to this. So he's he's taking all these notes and then he's got one page in his notes collection in his research that he's then adding things. And I won't read all of these because some of them are like spoilers, kind of in a sense for later chapters. Um, but this one is interesting because it's Harker takes back his, they have his report to something like an un, an unknown word. And this happens more frequently in the notes than we admit to. We had an issue last week where we were trying to, Elizabeth was correcting me because I said stopping the earth. And it seems like, is that a hunting term or is it shifting the earth or is it shipping the earth? And there seems to be these places in the, in the notes that we don't have the, uh, um, we can't really decipher yet. And this is Elizabeth Miller and Robert 18 Bissang who, who labored over these notes and, and couldn't in the end decipher all of this. Um, this is an experiment. Is that what it says after? Um, well, yeah, it's uh, they have it translated as Harker takes back his report, and I'm not even sure if that is report. I don't think it is actually Looks to like... something, and this is untranslated here. I can't figure it out either. And then it says this is an experiment of travel of Drac. Hmm. And then it says just at or missed at ship, and then it says reason that he wants to escape. Van Helsing shows that Dracula gets bolder, gets bolder in time and finds out he can shift his own. They wrote earth here. And I guess now I can see that now the E, the A, R, T, H, shift his own earth. So that's also all about what's been going on in this chapter too. Dracula's figured out that he can shift his own earth, that he can move his own earth around. Um, 
but I don't know what this Harker stuff is in the beginning. Um, takes back his report to, I guess, everybody. Um, and it's, it's it, what confuses me is this is an experiment of travel of Drac. I'm, I'm not quite sure what he's hinting at here. Um, part of the joy of going through these notes, the frustrating joy kind of thing is like, I can't read this word. Um, and, and you really want to know what it is, but it's, it's further studies if, if people, especially once we're open, if people want to come to the Rosenbach and take a look at some of these notes and decipher some of these words that we have not been able to decipher yet. Part of uh, the mystery of Dracula always draws you in and repulses you a little bit at the same time. Yes. So um, uh, there are very interesting things here. Rita had, Rita had had texted that back, now you're saying it upside down, that this could have been a seven, like 97. That's too late. 5497 is too late for this note. So, um, you know, I don't know. It's it well, if, it had, if it had faded so much that he had to literally rewrite the whole note for it to be readable. I mean, it, may, it could just be a really old note. It would take a while for something to fade that badly. And to rewrite it to change it too, right? Yeah. Like, like alter the details of this note. Right. Um, it's, it's totally fascinating. And it's one of the ways, one of the reasons I love working uh, with these notes. So um, that is, there's, there's all these studies about, uh, or, or people are deciphering notes. Um, uh, Elizabeth says uh, uh, Miller and in the facsimile edition, Miller at 18 is saying, don't mention the 5491 date. And it's true. They don't, I looked in there they, they don't have a mention of that date. Uh, she says, the only thing I can think of is that it's a leftover from the layer of writing underneath, which is what I think. So that would be much earlier than any others. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out. I mean, maybe if you really look at it and squint, you can really read what he's written over. Um, when the, uh, one of the people doing the uh, research in the Melville's Marginalia in, in Herman Melville's books and how it was erased um, by, uh, sometimes by his uh, widow, and then, and then the books, you know, were, were later sold. Um, one of the ways that, that they figure out what was written is by squinting <laughs> uh, and he's like it's just it's just simple sometimes you really just have to squint and look at it and you can work it out other times it's infrared lights and all these you know lights shine light through it and all kinds of different ways to do it but sometimes if you just squint you can figure it out so i will uh like to know what this note reads and um we will see if i can find out more of that and report back to you so, but let's get back to this chapter where they're all waiting for Dracula to arrive and we could hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. I mean, he's coming. And then here comes Quincy, has always been the one to arrange the plan of action. I, I just picture like this, the opening credits for the Quincy man of action show. Ba -ba! And Quincy, you know, gets, you know, ready to, explosions are going off. Um, uh, Quincy gets everyone ready. I find it so distracting whenever they suddenly, but like it, there's suddenly this sense that they've always been an action adventuring party. It seems to just come from a totally different book or a different genre, even where it's like, do you see, I mean, outside of Quincy, who's sort of a, you know, like as an adventurous kind of character, the rest of them are all just sort of these Victorian types Jonathan's um, a solicitor and you know yeah but like oh we've been adven in adventures together all over the world and we that, we, that we just know instinctively how to move into position at Quincy's command and it's like wait who are these people it's it's so distracting Quint and Stoker loses track of it and actually in the typescript that you can see in the drafts of Dracula in the typescript he starts mentioning Seward mentions how Oh, the time when Jonathan, uh, you know, used his kukri knife on that snake attack him or something right. like that. And it's like, and then he crossed it out because he realized, actually, Jonathan didn't do that. He's probably thinking of Quincy. Um, yeah, Jonathan didn't even know Quincy, right? Or Seward. John, yeah, Jonathan didn't know Quincy. Or Seward. Jonathan didn't know any of them. Mm -hmm. um, but the count's coming and... Quincy's getting them ready. He's arranging the plan of attack. Um, the slow, careful steps came, came along the wall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least he feared it. Um, and then suddenly, with a single bound, he leaped into the room uh, with a, and he was panther like 
in in the movement something so unhuman i like how i love that it's not inhuman it's something so unhuman uh and then the first to react was harker uh, so jonathan and and of course he is because he's the one that he's, he's begging to fight dracula at this point um and harker um uh, throws him with a quick movement threw himself before the door leading into the room in front of the house and the count sees them and a horrible sort of snarl passed over his face showing the eye teeth long and pointed but the evil smile as quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain god i love that phrase that is a great sentence so he is and, it's, and he's very bestial here. He's panther-like. Uh, he's got the pointed teeth. He's snarling. And he's got the lion, the cold stare of lion-like disdain. All this that Dracula is far more like an animal than he is like a human. Like that is what being a vampire has done to him. It has taken his humanity away and, and replaced it with this kind of bestial, you know, evil um with a child brain um <laughs> which which is what he has um and then we all advanced on him uh jonathan is like jonathan evidently meant to try the matter for he for he had ready his great kukri knife um do you have a kukri knife in your kit <laughs> no we considered it it did not seem practical also yeah. international shipping of weapons can be <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be able to do that. But a cooker knife, people don't know, it's like one of those kind of curved blade. It almost looks like a boomerang kind of blade. Um, and uh, uh, they were um, and they were kind of, you know, mementos of the East or of India that people, some people would have. Uh, it is a little odd that Jonathan has a cookery knife. Um, I do. I have a close friend who lives in Nepal who has been trying to convince us to and he's like i can source some genuine nepalese kukri knives for you if you need me to <laughs> <laughs> there you go um the uh um but jonathan pulls out his kukri knife and he just goes right for him made a fierce and sudden cut at him and the blow was a powerful one only the diabolical quickness of the count's leap back saved him so he's not only bestial animal like he's also devil like he is it's, it's diabolical um a second less and the trenchant blade had shorn through his heart as it was the point just cut the cloth of his coat making a wide gap whence a bundle of banknotes and stream of gold fell out i love that uh, mm -hmm. And everybody's mentioned it. Kim Newman mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, other people mentioned it. it's like Dracula's bleeding gold. Mm -hmm. You cut him, gold comes pouring out. Now, clearly, he actually hasn't been cut. He only cut the cloth of the coat. And that's why, you know, he's bleeding gold. But the image is really there. And then it says, the Count's face was so hellish. Um, the... Um, um, I, I, I just, that, that bleeding money is a great... It, I mean, we can read it metaphorically, and I want to hit that maybe at the end of this paragraph here. Um, uh, so, so hold that because Van Helsing walks right up and holding the crucifix. Oh no, this is Seward holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand. I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, um, and the the monster cowed back. And then everybody does this, and I saw the monster cow back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each one of us. So they're holding up the crucifix and the wafer, and the count is cowering from them. Uh, a powerful moment for them in fighting him to understand that, oh, this superstitious stuff really works, doesn't it? Um, and. Uh, it says the monster cower, the mo I saw the monster cower back before, okay. Uh, express, and he had as an expression of hate and baffled malignity. I love that. Baffled malignity of anger and hellish rage came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes and the red scar on the forehead. Not to mention that, that's where Jonathan hit him with the shovel uh, show, way back at the castle. Uh, the, the, the scar showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Stoker's arm, ere his blow could fall, and grasping a handful of the money from the floor, dashed across the room, threw himself at the window. 
Amid the crash and glitter of the falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. Though through the sound of the shivering glass, I could hear the ting of the gold as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging. Now, we get money, money falls out, um, money falls on the floor. Uh, he picks up the money and then even the ting of the gold as if like in one paragraph, Stoker's like money, money, money. Like, mm -hmm. and even, even that image, the ting of the gold, like it's like a little bell, like pay attention. There's gold falling on the ground here. Um, and I just, is there any, is there any way we could really think of this metaphor? What does this gold represent in in this scheme of this novel. Have, have you thought about Well, that? I mean, yeah, it's also interesting that the first time we see Dracula as the uh, as the like carriage driver, he's stopping to seek the blue flame to to mark where the where the golden treasure is. Yeah. Um so he's very connected to gold and money and treasure. I mean, I, I do wonder if that connects a little bit to the sort of anti-Semitic cliches um, that we associate with Dracula. Um, especially like, um, you know, there's the, in this moment, there's a sort of like desperation as he's as he's like yeah. scrabbling on the pavement to get all the money. And it does it does read as as possibly connected to some of the anti-Semitic stuff to me. Although he doesn't give him that, you know, kind of I mean, had he mentioned the aquiline nose in this past, yeah. I would really grab on to that. Right. Um, but Kim Newman was talking about how it's kind of like this. It's it's the it's the power of the empire is also in its financial institutions. Yes. Dracula is, first he has all this old gold in his castle that he's left get dusty. He doesn't even care about it. Um, and uh, and Jonathan notices this, that it's covered in, oh, it's actually, no, sorry. It's covered in dirt because he's dug it up. So from the ground, right? apparently in these uh, excursions to find the old gold buried that the blue flames, you know, reveal to him. So. But that's the old gold of the kingdom uh, of the of of the ancient regimes of Europe, and now he's in England, and he just doesn't have gold here. He has bank notes. Yeah, um, well, and it's like so much of the power that uh, Dracula is exercising in England is is economic, financial power. I mean, it's not all supernatural. It's you know from from his his castle originally he's he's got lawyers and solicitors figuring out real estate deals yep. and he's got people moving boxes these are all people like people he's hired to do things he's exercising the sort of power of a wealthy aristocrat um so it sort of fits it, it fits with that and it's it's how he how he sort of enters this this new world it's how he's trying to update himself into the world of capital he needs um, it too you know yeah. he needs it to operate in this world but you know is it so and it and is the but this image of when you cut him he money pours out is that a kind of you know this is the that, that in destroying him he's trying to amass this financial power as well and when you attack him you're also that is one of the things maybe either you should be attacking or you are attacking is the financial power he has amassed. Um, uh, so uh, that's- Well, it's, it's just sort of one of the many ways that I feel like the, the metaphors in Dracula, they're never easy. They're never totally straightforward what Dracula represents or what the supernatural versus the modern versus the technological is. Because Dracula represents like the, the ancient superstitious past but also represents like capital in, in some ways. It's, yeah. it's, it's very interesting, like how, how those things connect. Um, but yeah, there's a lot going on with, with the relationship between Dracula and wealth and money. Here we have the big moment because he turns and speaks to them. You wanna read this? You wanna read Dracula's great yes. threat burn? I, I feel like Dracula really you know, burns them here. So go ahead. You think to baffle me, you, with your pale faces all in a row, like sheep in a butcher's. You shall be sorry yet, each one of you. You think you have left me without a place to rest, but I have more. My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already. 
and through them you and others shall yet be mine, my creatures, to do my bidding and to be my jackals when I want to feed. Bah! God, just finish that. With a contemptuous... With a contemptuous sneer, he passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. A door beyond opened and shut. The first of us to speak was the professor, as realizing the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved towards the hall. All right, let's hit his, his threat, first of all, which is, is chilling. Yes. Um, uh, and it's, you know, your pale faces all in a row, like shit, good. butchers. <laughs> Um, that's so it's, great. Um, it's some pretty good villain dialogue. That's like really good. And then what? And then you know you've left me without a place to you. You think you have left me without a place to rest, but I have more. Well, he has one more. Um, and uh, so there is a, you know, he, they have struck a blow against you. It's just not you know lethal yet. And then he says, "My revenge has just begun." I spread it over centuries and time is on my side. I don't know. If I kind of heard that threat, I might just quit. Like, you're right. <laughs> you have literally been alive for centuries. Yeah. Uh, why uh, would well, I really think I could stop you at this point? So, right, right. But it's interesting uh, this line, like, I spread it over centuries, kind of implies that yeah, I, I, it's not clear who his revenge is on. Um, is Dracula taking revenge? on uh, like modern London for some, you know, distant past? Uh, Is there a grievance from hundreds of years ago that is being played out here? Is he talking about revenge against our main characters, which will be spread out over centuries to come? Is it both? I mean, it's it's an interesting line and there's a lot of different ways you can- They're all hitting it in the chat right now. Tucker Star, like revenge for what? And everybody's like talking about revenge. I mean, what is his revenge that's happening here? you know, I mean, there, there's a very basic my revenge against you guys for actually, you know, right. coming against me. But um, but I've spread it over centuries. Is the you know that I, it's yeah, I I think it's his revenge against humanity. And this is another one of those little moments where you get some personal things from him, like earlier with the vampire women and dra- and they say like, and he and he says to them, you know, I too have loved kind of thing. I mean, and then people build upon that little thing that he said and kind of try to come up with the backstory. Um, and here again, what is his revenge over the centuries? It's Stoker given this little glimpse into Dracula's thinking that he thinks he has been taking revenge over centuries. And so why, what is that all about? And, and that's what we have to write fic- our own fiction for. <laughs> to, yeah. to develop that idea. But the fact that he has it, I think is powerful because it's not this also again is he's not just an animal out to feed that's not the complete point for him that he also is attacking civilization or at least this new civilization in some kind of vengeful way and um that's more than just him being a beast um I really like yeah, it. and it's just it's it's one of the many ways that Dracula invites you in and then points to things that exist outside of the text, and you yeah. sort of have to figure them out for yourself. It's uh, there's so many places this this book does that and it invites me, you. To, I mean, I, that, I think that's part of the reason it spawned so much yeah. fan fiction, spinoffs, new versions, rethinkings. And for these Victorian men, this is the sickest burn of all, right? Your girls that you yes. love are mine already. Um, like, I'm already feeding on your women. You can't even protect your women. You think you're going to destroy me. Um, and through them, you and others shall yet be mine. My creatures to do my bidding, to be my jackals when I want to feed. Um, bah! Uh, and then a contemptuous sneer. Um, the, uh, but also that idea, too, that he is as as um uh as van helsing said earlier about kind of creating this new race um but but he has it in this um language that uh the father and furtherer of a new order of beings yes dracula says he's doing that but it's also these order of beings that he can just that he's running that he could just feed on you and you know you're just his you're just his sheep, his jackals that he uses 
Um, uh, so he's not even creating this great order of people, this great order of beings. He's creating these other beings that he will even use and demoralize in the same way he does anyone else. So um, a great uh, a great threat from Dracula. Ben Helsing wants nothing to do with this threat. He's like, ah, we've learned stuff, but don't worry, because he's afraid of us now. Um, uh, I'm not sure of that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I really heard that. I think he says Dracula needs to uh, hurry now. Why take that money? Um, well, yeah, because he needs the money. He's, he's literally leaving now. Um, well, he does flee. I mean, I think that's why we need this this line of, of very ominous dialogue so Dracula isn't totally stripped of his menace. Uh, because in this scene, I mean, they sort of best Dracula in this fight. They don't get him, but uh, he doesn't hurt any of them, and he, he jumps out a window and runs away. Uh, Kim Newman talked about this a couple weeks ago, because when he redid the novel in that chapter 21, when they come in and they find Dracula with me and Ann Harker on the bed, um, Kim Newman and reimagined just like, yeah. And then Dracula just kills everybody because he right. can't. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. like, why wouldn't he? Now in the novel, it's the host, you know, keeps him back. And here again, it's the crosses and the host. So I think Stoker is pretty serious about this. And, and this is a pretty strong point. You have to remember that the host and crucifix really do repel Dracula in this novel. It really does give you a power. The evidence is in the text. Seward not only feels it, but Dracula then jumps out the window because yeah. they're holding it there. So it's as pa- excuse me, as powerful as he is, those things works as as you know, apotropaics as things that ward off evil. They actually work and. If you're going to have that set up around, like garlic, he can find a way around. I can have the wolf knock it off the window. Somebody else can take it off, that kind of thing. But this is a little harder for him to combat against. And this is kind of really furthering the, you know, the the way that Van Helsing really is going to turn this into, this is a holy crusade. If this is what works to repel him and get him to flee from us, then this is where we need to, you know, rely on and put our faith in and use uh, to defeat him. Um, Van Helsing then talking about you are hunters of wild beasts and understand it. So he's telling the other guys. Um, uh, and then, uh, so, so we're fine. Don't worry. He's fleeing us. We're actually on the right track. Um, I, maybe I do. Like I, I originally said, I'm not so sure the track. I think he is. I, I think. Well, he's sort of right. I mean, the, the book takes a turn at this point where the main characters really become the, they sort of have the upper hand on Dracula almost yeah. for the rest of the book. Uh, I mean, they're chasing him as opposed to the other way around. Yes. Or at least pretty shortly. Turn. Like Mina was oh. the last one and now yeah. turned the tables. Now we're pursuing you. You're not preying upon us. Yeah, which is sort of an unusual structure. Um, and it's challenging, I think, to maintain the tension of the book when Dracula is afraid of us instead of us being afraid of Dracula. Um, but I think Stoker sort of threads that needle in an interesting way. What's well, the tension now? It's a tension and the suspense. Yeah. He's going to be able to catch him in the end. Is he going to kill any one of you, any or any more of you going to die as this goes on? And especially with Mina, because Mina, the suspense is as she's turning over the last few chapters. Yeah. That's the real suspense that drives this. Because all this is this is any monster movie or, or monster story does this. At some point, you're chasing the monster. Not all of them, but especially if you have a band, you are chasing the monster by the end. And but they don't always have the monster fleeing from you. That's pretty unusual, I think. Yeah. In all monster movies, eventually you take arms against the creature. That's true. Um, but rarely does the creature run in the other direction and you chase him, you know, for countries <laughs> after countries. Like, so it's unusual and very, it's very sort of disempowering of the of the thing that you're supposed to be afraid of in this book. And you're right, he does use Mina's transformation as that becomes the real suspense, the thing that we're, we're frightened of. Yeah. Um, Don't miss this point here because after Van Helsing gives this line, he says, as he spoke, he put the, rem- he put the money remaining into his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> right. like, I just picture like Van Helsing talking and it's like, oh, I'm a little money here. I'm gonna- <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
um the uh so he, he takes the money but he also takes the title deeds and the bundle. but but then he sweeps the remaining things into the open fireplace and you know for my purposes as the the one whose job it is to figure out what all of the objects in dracula are and where they end up and what are the remaining things what does he put in the fireplace um whatever papers pertaining to anything i mean well i guess it's what, what papers? the title deeds maybe there's letters there memos about right you know, but we don't know what letters memos what's only destroyed, what's the title not. deeds that's all yeah. that, that's all that he says and everything else goes goes into the fire um I, i'm curious why he decides to, to destroy these documents i don't maybe, really get maybe this. he's being petty because that's what dracula did in the last chapter he's right like, yeah yeah, yeah. there's stuff in the fire like oh i'll show him him. right <laughs> <laughs> but um uh and i guess if it's any information about um like he doesn't like they don't need all of this but at least you would think i mean it. if it's stuff they haven't fully read through you think maybe they just take it and think we'll look at this later maybe there's a clue in there yeah well but he burns it and um Harker, of course, lowers himself from the window. Like Van Helsing's giving this talk, picking up money, doing this. Harker's like climbing out the window yeah. um, to chase him. And uh, but the door is locked, as, as you read, and um, and they realize that it's late in the afternoon and sunset was not far off. Let us go back to Madame Mina. Poor, poor, dear Madame Mina. All we can do just now is done, and we can there at least protect her. Oh, really? <laughs> like, I mean, she's, you know, the one sending you telegrams yeah. to protect you, right? Um, the, uh, uh, and, uh, and Seward noticed, Seward in his, the way he's singing this is, he says, I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could to comfort Harker. Uh, the poor fellow was quite broken down. Now and again, he gave a low groan, which he could not suppress. He was thinking of his wife. So this is a failed opportunity for Harker. Harker thought, oh my gosh, we've caught Dracula. Now we can kill him. And Dracula is gone. And Harker is crushed by this. So, um, so they go back to the house and Mrs. Harker was waiting us with the appearance of cheerfulness, which did honor to her bravery and unselfishness. All this patronizing talk here. And then uh, she, <coughs> she saw our faces and her own became as pale as death. <coughs> and she's like, oh no, like you guys were in something serious. And then she says, I can never thank you all enough. Oh, my poor darling. And she's, you know, putting, you know, uh, uh, lay your poor head here and rest it. All will be well, all will be well, dear. And Mina gets to play mother again with her husband, no less. So Mina has to be mom and take care of you. Console Jonathan. Like Mina, you were the, like, again, like what, 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 what it's, it's her strength to, to move on. It's her strength to have this awful thing happen to her. And she's the one moving forward and consoling them. And, um, uh, you know, she's the one that was attacked. She, that, but she's going to console them and take care of them. Um, as she does again, this is, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's Stoker not able to kind of follow through with the great strong character you have created. Instead, he has to fall back on the Mina's the angel in the house. Mina's the mother figure for all these men. Um, they, um, they're miserable, but they had a perfunctory supper and the mere animal heat of food to hungry people for none of us had eaten anything since breakfast or the sense of companionship but anyhow we were all less miserable and save the morrow is not altogether without hope I, I i like that idea that they have kind of food and ordinary activities and companionship kind of restore them um uh that you know it's it, even in the midst of all this traumatic events that a very simple thing will help restore you to, you know, go on and and uh, and fight another day. Um, and then they, um, oh, and then true to our promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed. Oh, well, that's so, you know, nice of you. True to your promise, we told everything that had passed. I mean, the, the fact that it's even still an issue, and we'll hit this again, I think, in the next chapter about what they're sharing. The fact that they didn't share information was a major problem and led to bad things going on. So are you still there, Josh? I only see your name. 
I think we've lost Josh momentarily. Hopefully we'll get him back soon. Um, the um, Sorry about that. My internet cut out there for a okay, second. Okay, that's all right. Um, but I was I was just saying that that kind of again they even mentioned you know the fact that they were holding information back from her and now that they, oh we're not going to do that anymore as if yeah well you shouldn't have done that to begin with um, is what I was saying and then uh, and then and then I just the idea like watching her and describing her and Seward says that she grew snowy white at times when danger had seemed to threaten her husband as they're telling her the story and red at others when his devotion to her was manifested. She listened bravely and with calmness, like, like they're testing her. Like, yes, we're going to share the information with you, but I'm going to watch how you react because you're a woman and this might really upset you too much. And um, so it's Seward really kind of watching her to see how she reacts um as as all of this is going on and um and and of course they had he has to mention the talk about the red scar on her forehead of which she was conscious and you know that's all there and then she says this great speech here to jonathan jonathan dear and you all my true true friends i want you to bear something in mind through all this dreadful time I know that you must fight, that you must destroy, even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live hereafter. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul who has wrought all this misery is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he too is destroyed in his worser part, that his better part may have spiritual immortality. You must be pitiful to him too, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. So yeah, destroy him, but clearly do it in a way that, that contains pity, that contains sympathy. It's for, a mercy killing. Yeah. And um, uh, it's Mina, of course, that has to remind them of this. Um, and especially as Jonathan is going over the edge in his quest for revenge, she needs to remind him of this. Well, it's interesting that this fits in both with Mina's sort of nature as a character, as the sympathetic person, but also fits in with her growing connection to Dracula. She can empathize with him in a way that the rest of the characters can't. She can relate right. to him. Right. You know, so as you know, it's she's connected right now. And um, that is part of her. You know, uh, the, uh, people are mentioning that in the in, in the uh, um, in the chat now too. How she's connected to him, and she needs to. And then, so she's she's the only one capable in this group of feeling pity because she has this connection to them. But also, well, and, and there's there's a theme that that really comes into focus in this chapter of like the danger of Jonathan losing his own soul yeah. to to vengeance and. Uh, um, to passion and that's what we see here in this you know because as she's saying this her husband's face grew darken and draw together he clasps his wife's hand so his knuckles are white but then she did not flinch from the pain which i knew she must have suffered but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever and i almost feel like she's staring him down <laughs> they're like she realizes that her, that her husband just wants revenge and can't we just destroy him and she's you can't do that um, she sees the demon in him yeah it's like that nietzsche quote that uh, uh look into the abyss quote yeah, you know, the, like, right. whoever fights monsters should see so it see to it that in the process uh he does not become a monster and if you gaze long enough into the abyss the abyss will gaze back into you that well, like the same thing van helsing warns him earlier about yeah, selling his so soul van helsing has warned him and now his wife is yeah. that you cannot become corrupted yourself in trying to destroy this monster. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is going on, but I do also agree that Mina's connected to Dracula. So she will feel pity for him, perhaps even in some deep recess of her mind, she kind of even knows who Dracula is like, like her knows him in a pre monster sense. Um, and then she reminds them, especially that perhaps someday, I too may need such pity. Um, and that, you know, that the fact that, look, I, I could become a vampire and you need to destroy me and 
I should, you should feel sorry for me, not, you know, let's just destroy her as they actually they did with Lucy. I mean, remember Seward and uh, talking about a little like, I could really destroy her now after they saw her. They were so yeah. angry at Lucy when she changed that they kind of reveled in the destruction of her. And Mina's like, you don't do that with me. Um, and uh, yeah, they sort of had a sense of that's not Lucy. That's the thing that destroyed Lucy. Yeah. And Mina is problematizing that and saying, no, it's, you know, she, she feels the transformation happening, and she, but she's still her. And so she knows whatever she would become would still be part her. Well, they all have a good cry over it. Um, they all break down. We men were all in tears now. There is no resisting them and we wept openly. So they have their good cry. And then Mina again, she has to be mom and takes Jonathan and hit his face in the folds of her dress and, you know, and they leave them alone. Um, and uh, the, uh, oh, and then Seward says, the professor fixed up the room, uh, I guess the, the Harker's room against any coming of the vampire and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. Really? I mean, <laughs> like, <laughs> don't worry, Mina, Dracula won't get All good. You. Like, All good. So full of shit. Um, Mina has read the accounts of how Drac of how they fixed up Lucy's room, mm -hmm. and he still came in and attacked her in her own bed. Uh, and Mina herself was not only attacked in her own bed; her husband was right next to her. Yeah. So there's really no way they can stop Dracula if he decides to come in at night. Um, uh, but. Um, they uh but they do but he does mention she doesn't know this yet that they're all actually going to take turns sitting outside the room um and that's actually you know yeah you know, somebody needs to be on watch like seriously on watch not not watching and falling asleep or you know anything like that so um jonathan um um wait do we have um Oh, no, but Van Helsing also placed at hand a bell, which either of them was to sound in case of any emergency. Oh, no, now I'm fine now. No, there's a bell. Yes, I'll read yeah. it. Like, ding, 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 ding. As, as though screaming would not do the job. You know? <laughs> we have a bell. So, yeah. Dracula, we have a bell. You can't yeah. have <laughs> that is amazing. That is not really good. Of all the pieces of technology they muster in the fight against Dracula, the bedside bell is a really bedside help. bell isn't really gonna do the job. Whether it summons the butler or or chases the demons away. So, but they're at least keeping a watch, and that's good. And now we have now we go to Jonathan here and his journal, and it's uh close to midnight as he's writing. So he goes in and he's writing after Mina is asleep. Um and uh, he's trying to come to grips with all the turmoil going on inside of his head of failing to get Dracula. Um, and he says, if he chooses to lie hidden, he may baffle, baffle us for years. And in the meantime, the thought is too horrible. I dare not think of it even now. Yeah, your wife is infected. She is turning. Um, he says, I love her a thousand times, uh, you know, for the pity she shows. And, and then he says, surely... God will not permit the world to be the poorer by law by the loss of such a creature. Well, you know, they all, all the other guys did nothing but talk about how Lucy was like the most perfect war girl in the world. And, you know, she was taken. So this is, you know, this is Jonathan trying to find some kind of faith uh, to, to remain, you know, strong in this. And he, and he says, we're all drifting reefwards now and faith is our only anger. Um, that he, he needs to find something to hold on to, to believe that they'll come through this. And he's, he mentions God and God won't do this and I need faith and all. But, but throughout this, it seems like it's, it's, it's Mina that he's really, you know, that, that, that all of the men, she, you know, she inspires faith in all of them. She's given them hope. Um, but, he doesn't go there right now that she has not been so calm within my seeing since the sunset. And then there's this, there came over her face a repose, which is, was like spring after the blasts of March. I thought at the time that it was the softness of the red sunset on her face, but somehow now I think it has a deeper meaning. And 
I think he's hinting that she's changing already and he's noticing this, isn't it? Is that um, well, like that's that's what I take from it. Yeah, I agree with that. Some kind of sign of you know change in her that she's you know she's been infected by the vampire and she's changing in a sense and he notices it. So so while he would or should put his faith in Mina, he can't because she's changing. She's got a scar on her. She's got a cross scar. Or no, I'm sorry, a host scar on her forehead cross. That's, that's Fright Night. Um, he's, he's got the host scar on her forehead. Um, and so he can't completely trust her in a way. Now that'll, that'll come to play as these next few chapters develop. Um, but then later Mina gets up, she hears something and like, and she just discovers, oh, it's just a guy sleeping out in the hall, you know? Oh, thank God for good, brave men, she says. Um, <laughs> Once again. <laughs> slap her when she says that. I don't know. That, that's mean. I should die. But you want to like, wake up me. I want to slap Stoker when she says yes, that. Yes, <laughs> that, thank you. So like, stop it. Stop, you know, saying these things. But it's not her. It's Stoker putting the words in her mouth. Um, the, uh, um, but then in the morning, it's still night. It's still dark out. It's before dawn. Uh, Mina gets up and she says, go call the professor. I want to see him at once. I have an idea. I suppose it must have come in the night and matured without my knowing it. He must hypnotize me before the dawn. And then I shall be able to speak. Go quickly, dear, as the time is getting close. So she comes up with this idea that, and especially as, as we've seen earlier, that the people have pointed out that if she's already demonstrated this psychic connection with Dracula that she knows where he's going. If that's how that happened, then she knows that she has a psychic connection and she could feel it at night. Like that, that look on her face that Jonathan sees is perhaps her when she's connecting to Dracula. Um, she tells um, Van Helsing to hypnotize her before the dawn for I feel that then I can speak and speak freely, be quick for the time is short. So um, it, it's time sensitive, uh, looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her from over the top of her head downwards with each hand a turn. So he's going through the, you know, you're getting sleepy um, thing that's going on here. And um, hypnotizing and, and mesmerism in the 19th century was, you know, it kind of develops late 18th century, but in the 19th century, it's still all about the, and, and in this novel too, people, believe it's about, they think it's the power of the person doing the hypnotizing. And it's actually not, it's about your ability to go out and your ability in a sense to hypnotize yourself with somebody guiding you in that direction. Um, and uh, I'm of course, I think right away of, of I've, I was, I've been reading, I just started reading finally uh, Trilby uh, with Svengali. And um, uh, I'm thinking of that too, um, especially when she goes into the trance. Um, and I think a lot of his readers too, because Trilby is the, the uh, George du Maurier novel is, is, was so enormously popular. And I think it's, it's a novel that at the time when this was published, it was still on all the readers' minds. It's still gotta be on Stoker's mind is this Svengali hypnotizing Trilby and she becomes this great performer and um, it was, but it's also in Stoke in Klinger's annotated um, that he talks about, he has a great note about how this is also more like a seance that they're doing here because especially because Mina is then contacting Drac, like an undead person and reading his, so she's contacting another person in this trance because of that psychic connection. It's not just uh, like, she's not just being hypnotized. She's act, it's actually operating as a way to connect to Dracula. So it's, and it's, it's more like a seance, which was something that was again on everybody's mind and people knew these things and did these things in the, in the late 19th century. Um, through the whole spiritualist movement to contact the dead. In yeah, I mean, she's literally contacting the dead. She's contacting the undead. The undead, yeah. Yes. Um, and he asks where she is now. Oh, especially because when she opened her eyes, she did not seem the same woman, uh, he writes. There was a faraway look in her eyes and her voice had a sad dreaminess, which was new to me. Um, 
And that also kind of seems to connect it with this Svengali Trilby relationship. She's kind of transformed in this trance. Um, and um, the others come in then. They came on tiptoe, which I always think is a funny image, like to see <laughs> tiptoe walk into a room. Uh, and Van Helsing asks, where are they now? Where are you? I do not know. Sleep has no place. It can call its own. Uh, and then he asks her again, where are you now? I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It is all dark. And then she hears the lapping of water. It is gurgling by and little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. Then you're on a ship. Oh, yes. What else do you hear? She hears the people on the ship, the chain of the anchor going down. What are you doing? I am still. Oh, so still. It is like death, she says. The voice faded away into a deep breath as one of, as of one sleeping and the open eyes closed again. And then she kind of goes to sleep and she wakes up like, have I been talking in my sleep? Like she doesn't remember this, that she just did this. Um, and then Van Helsing realizes right away that they're on a ship. Um, they, uh, everybody's ready to run out the door and Van Helsing's like, well, don't worry, it was weighing anchor. Um, there's a lot of ships weighing anchor in London. Um, and then as he's, I love this. He has this long sentence here. Uh, we have been blind, somewhat blind after the manner of men since when we can look back, we see what we might have seen looking forward if we had been able to see what we might have seen. Um, uh, great Van Helsingism. And then, but he even knows and he says, alas, but that sentence is a puddle, is it not? I love that sentence is a puddle. <laughs> That's a great expression. Great line. Um, and then he mentions that the Count sees the money. He meant escape. He's got one box of earth left and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox. This London was no place for him. He have take his last box on board a ship and he leave the land. And then he even says, tally ho. <laughs> um, I too am wily and I think his mind in a little while. Well, I think his mind in a little while like that. He's like, I'm going to think like he does like that. That's a cliche of like hunting the killer kind of thing. Like think like the killer and then, you know, you can catch him. And um, they, um, and then Mina asks at the very end of this chapter, she's like, oh, well, he's going away. Like, why do we even have to go after him? And Van Helsing's like, don't ask me that yet. Wait for, wait for breakfast. And then at breakfast, he says, because my dear Madam Mina, now more than ever must we find him, even if we have to follow him to the jaws of hell. Why? Because he can live for centuries and you are but mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded since once he put that mark upon your throat. And Jonathan writes, I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. So um, Mina's doomed. Uh, she's mortal. They have to catch him and kill him or else she's just going to become a vampire. And, um, and Mina finally behaves like a respectable Victorian woman in a situation and faints. Um, yes. That is what they, that's what they've been waiting for you to right. do all along, Mina. Would you just faint already so we can save you? Um, and she does. And um, uh, but they're right. They Dracula is running from them, and uh, now they've you know they've they've, they've just got to figure out what ship he's on. The ship is like. How Van Helsing figures that out is a little crazy, but that's exactly what Sherlock Holmes would do. Like, oh, that was the sound of the chain going down, not coming, you know. So um, uh, they know that, the, that at least for now, the ship is at anchor and can't leave yet. Uh, and so they now need to go find him. So any words to finish this, uh, Josh? Anything I didn't No, hear? I just love this scene. I love this little, this little seance and the, it's very haunting and interesting and the... The, the sort of sensory way that Mina describes everything and reveals that, that he's on the boat. Um, and uh, yeah, the one thing I don't understand here is, I mean, Dracula is already on this ship, but Van Helsing seems to imply there is water that he cannot pass. Um, oh, that has been, I was going to hit that today and then I had it on my list and then I took it off. And that kind of, he can only, 
like it's the slack of tide and the um but i, I thought the implication was that once water. dracula is passively on a ship like he can't cross running water but a ship he's on can cross running water can yes. it wasn't that the implication yes. Yeah. So I don't get really what Van Helsing is saying. Since he's already sleeping on this ship, the ship will do whatever the ship is going to do. Yeah. Um, So I'm not sure what the implication there is. Um, But I I, I just think this is such a clever way of having, uh, of of connecting Mina to Dracula and and getting our vampire hunters uh, their their next clue. I think it's, it's such a cool moment in this book. Yes, it is. So, um, all right. Well, Mina falls forward into a faint, and that's where we'll have to end it this week. So, Dracula Files, thanks for tuning in today. I'll post this recording on our website if that's how you're watching it now. Thank you so much for watching the replay. We have a Sundays with Dracula Facebook group where we can continue the conversation. Look us up on Facebook, join in that conversation. I'm always available to answer questions by email as well at epedit at rosenback.org. Uh, and I encourage you all, if you're going to drink, then try some spirits from Tamworth Distilling and Art in the Age, the Ski Klubin, uh, and the in the Bloody Mary mix, the Bloody the Vampire Slayer mix was was delicious. And with uh, apple cider, especially warm cider, it is absolutely delicious. And that little shot of hearing cherry really turned it into something else. So the October hunt, I call it. Don't forget to join me tomorrow night for Monday Drag Chat with Draculophile Matt Hebert. Remember to register for it ahead of time. It's Dracula Club and members of the Rosenback only. And if you're looking for more virtual engagement, head on over to the Rosenback website. Check out the other virtual offerings we have. If you sign up for the Dracula, the Enduring Monster presentations or the David Copperfield course, I'd be more grateful than Van Helsing pocketing that spare change that Dracula dropped on the way out. So, uh, Josh, thank you for being here today. I'm so happy you're back. Oh, thank you, Ed. And thanks everybody for coming. I, I really missed it. It was great, great to be back here. Good. And we'll get a link on Wednesday about the, the, uh, art book, uh, the, the book edition. Of yes, absolutely. I'll send Dracula. you guys all the info. Excellent. That is so great. Join us next week, everyone for Sundays with Dracula for chapter 24 when the hunt for Dracula becomes a holy crusade to set the world free. And next week will also be the final time with our co-host ghoul guides from England, Mary Going and Dr. Lauren Nixon. So you don't want to miss them next week. Once again, we'll be played out by Tucker Christine's pleated gazelle song, Storm into Whitby, which I love more every day. And farewell, everyone. And in a friends of our In the words of our friend Dracula, go safely and leave something of the happiness you bring. Bye-bye. I'll see you, Josh. Bye, Ed.